and 20. We're in the same spot one more time at least here in uh, Revelation 20. Let's stand and just read verse 11 through 15. We talked about the earth's judgment. Now we'll talk about the, uh, the judgment here um, that's described in uh, 12 through 15. But Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15. And we should have hopefully uh, uh, some verses and time to, to look at. If you have questions and things, we'll try to accomplish that too. In, in verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth, the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. <clears throat> the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. They were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let's be seated. Lord, bless your word. We sure need your help and your presence, your power. Grateful for uh, all that you've done, will do. And thank you again uh, for the promise that your word would not return void. It would accomplish the purpose that it's sent out to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we lo- last time we talked about who the judge is, and that's the, Jesus, the word. We looked at the earth and how it's the footstool and how it's destined for judgment and the enemies of the Lord will become the footstool. And so we put that that phrase and that thought together last week. And now we we look at there's a couple of of groups here, a couple of of different um, explanation of these judgments. And I, I feel like I've taught this specific thing a bunch of times and and it's helped me to understand, to separate the different judgments. We, uh, there, it's not just one general judgment at the end where everyone goes and gets rewarded or gets consequences. That's not the way uh, it works. Um, the judgment seat of Christ is a little earlier than this one, and that's when rewards are given because the, uh, the foundation is Jesus. And so if you've got Jesus as your Savior, say amen. amen. Uh, we're, we're not judged for our sin, although we do give an account for what's done good and bad in the body. Well, how do we not judge by our sin, but we give an account? And that's, that's a good question. And I'll, I'll try to explain that with Scripture today. Um, but in verse 12 through 15, notice it says the dead. The dead, small and great, stand before God. In verse number 4 and 5 of chapter 20, we looked at those who were martyred and it said, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. But this verse 12 through 15, it's not the first resurrection. This is the second resurrection. They're not living again. Notice it doesn't say the dead were alive. It just says, I saw the dead stand before God. They're not uh, given a, a new life, they are just brought up to stand and get sentencing. They're still the dead. They're the considered the lost or those without everlasting life. And they are resurrected to take this uh, sentencing and then they will go to the lake of fire, which is called the second death. Second resurrection, second death. First resurrection, first life. Okay, and so... Blessed is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on whom the second death hath no power. And so we're now looking at when hell, death and hell, gives up the dead which were in them, and they'll stand in front of God. So who is judged? It's the dead. Notice in verse 12, where do they come from? It say, I'm sorry, notice uh, what they stand in front of. They stand in front of the books. In verse 12, the book of life is opened. And there's some verses about the book of life in the New Testament. I'm going to skip over those for time. But it does tell us that we ought to rejoice that our names are written in the book of life more than being able to cast out devils or do anything else that uh, the apostles or disciples could do. So you think about uh, mighty works, miracles, healings. That's all secondary to having your name written in the book of life. Amen? 
Uh, it'd be wonderful for somebody to be able to lay hands. I'd love for somebody to lay hands on my bald head and make hair grow again. You know, where's that healer at? I want to go to that ministry and let him lay hands on my dead scalp and, and, and resurrect my hair. That'd be a, I'd be there and, 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 and praying and give me a prayer cloth to put on there. Whatever miracle, and I'm not trying to make fun of it, I'm saying whatever miracle might be done, and God does miracles, but any miracle that would be done is secondary to having your name written in the book of life. Amen to that. You could have temporary healings and still go to hell. You could have your hair grow back and still not have your name written in the book of life. See, so let's, I think that the, the most important things should be kept most important. And this, this judgment here will be according to their works. Well, let's just talk about that a second. Would anyone make it to heaven according to their works? No one would be able to stand and be uh, judged righteous according to our works. I'm not going to heaven because of my works, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. And so this is, this is compared <clears throat> to the Christian's judgment. And I know I've taught this, and you may have this all down in your mind. Great, but let me just look at you, show it one more time. Look at verse 12. It says, the dead, in the last phrase says, they're judged according to their... So who's being judged? The dead. How are they being judged? By their works. In other words, here's the throne. Here's the white throne. And then a guy comes out of hell and stands up there. And then he is the one being judged in front of the throne and they're going to look, and as if his name's not in the book of life, which obviously it's not, or he wouldn't have been in hell where he came from, right? He's, he comes up, and then he will be sentenced to the second death. He's found guilty by his works. If any of us were standing in that judgment seat, we would all be found guilty. So it's not a, 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 a case of, well, here's our advocate, the Lord Jesus. No, no, no. No, you had to have Jesus before you before you went to hell uh, to be your advocate as far as this judgment. So the person is being judged. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and notice the difference of this judgment. First Corinthians 3, verse 10, 11 to get started. And this should be, if you ever struggle or have doubts about eternal security, this is a great passage to compare these two and, and get this uh, nailed down in your mind. Look at verse 10 and 11. It says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So we're talking about building. That, that has to do with work, right? If you're ever a builder, they do work. Verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is... So you can't have salvation, you can't have a foundation without Jesus Christ. Amen? <clears throat> if you've got Jesus Christ, then our works have something to be built upon. But without the foundation, it's like that parable of the rock and the sand, and you can build a house, but when the storms come and it's built on the sand, the house goes away. But if it's built on the rock, the house can stand. And Jesus is the rock. So you get the illustration, get the picture. He says you're going to build, but you've got to have the right foundation. No man can lay any different foundation than Jesus Christ. Look at verse uh, 12. What do you build on the foundation? Now, if any man build upon this foundation, that's Jesus, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. So six, category, uh, six, six um, materials, two categories, good and bad. Gold, silver, and precious stone, wonderful, okay? I'd like to have more of it. If you, got, if you don't want yours, just give it to me. I'll take it from you, okay? I'll take it for you and hold it. Wood, hay, and stubble, um, I've done plenty of hay, okay? I know what that is. I've, I've chopped wood and cut wood and, uh, and stubble. Uh, you know what that is? That's after you cut a wheat field, and it's the shafts of wheat that are left. That's the stubble, and they're very flammable. It's a hollow, dry wheat stem. That's stubble. It's not the, the hair on your cheek at 5 o'clock, okay? That's a different kind of stubble, but uh, that's what it's talking about. 
verse 13. Now watch this judgment. Is every man judged in verse 13? What's being judged? Every man or every man's work? Every man's work shall be made manifest. Do you see the difference? In Revelation 20, every man is being judged by his works. In 1 Corinthians 3, every man's work is being judged. So here's the difference, okay? On this judgment, I'm hauling up my works and setting them in front of Jesus, and Jesus will judge my works. He's not judging me. He's judging my works. Over here, this guy, he's the one being judged by what, by what uh, standard? By his works. So they're bad, and they're going to judge that lost, dead man. Over here, I'm not being judged. My works are being judged. Okay? If I make a pie and take it to the fair, they're not tasting me. They're not licking my finger. Wow, you taste good. No, they're, they're, licking the, they're eating the pie and seeing how good the pie tastes. They're judging the pie and see if it gets a blue ribbon or not. They're not judging me. Now, I may receive a ribbon for it. I might receive a, a prize, but they're judging the pie, not the person. Does that make sense? So keep reading. <clears throat> Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, not him. Because it, the works, verse 13, shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's of what sort it is. Well, you got a big pile of works. There's some gold in there, hopefully, and there's some wood in there. How do we know what's in there? Set it on fire. Because you know what happens to wood, hay, and stubble? It's gone. You know what happens to gold when you burn it? It purifies it. It gets out the impurities, and you can have up to 24 karat gold. So look, it, verse, verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a blue ribbon, a reward. <clears throat> There's something given to him if he has gold, silver, and precious stone. That's how we're going to give an account for what's done good, gold, silver, precious stone, or bad, wood, hate, stubble. That's how we give an account as a Christian. So, well, preacher, you just get saved and you just live however you want? No, you're going to give an account. Keep reading. If any man, verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall... Now, I don't know what that loss is. Obviously, it's a loss of your work. It's a loss of your time. It's a loss of your investment. I, I don't know, loss of crowns, you don't, you, crowns can be lost. But notice the rest of verse 15. But, whatever you lose, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And that's a blessing to me. I don't want my works to burn up, but whatever burns up, I'm not, I'm saved from that fire. I'm not the one being judged. You see that? My work is being judged, and hopefully I'll receive a crown. There's going to be some loss, I'm sure. There's some regrets from every Christian since you've been saved. Would you all say amen to that? Yeah. Wish we'd have done better. I wish we'd have said no to sin. Oh, I can't believe I got offended over that, or I got uh, dissuaded or, or distracted over that. that that's that's going to happen, and that's going to be taken care of. But you are not being judged at this one. 1 Corinthians 3, it's your works. Revelation 20, it's you, brother. If you're not saved, you're getting judged by the works. There's no reward for good. It's just revealed that all of us are bad. Here, there's a reward and there's a suffering for the, the good suffering loss of the, of the works that we've done. So you see the difference? Judgment seat of Christ works. Donna? For the gold, silver, and precious stone? Oh, over here? They're judged by their works. And so what's going to happen, I, I think that, that uh, the Ten Commandments are going to be brought up, and God's going to say, did you have any other gods before me? Guilty. Did you ever tell a lie? Guilty. Did you ever steal? 
And that dead man who came out of hell, he's going to be judged and found guilty because his works prove that he sinned. And he's broken God's law. And so that's why he's sentenced to the second death, because he's broken God's law. Carol? Because their good works don't pay for the bad. So if I'm guilty of one part of the law, I'm guilty of the, the whole law. I've broken the law. That's James chapter 2. So we look at people and say, man, that's a good neighbor. Man, that's a good person. But the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. What do you mean, God? Well, the standard is the glory of God, and that's perfection. That's why if a person is at this judgment, they do not have an answer for their sin, and they're going to be found guilty. These guys over here, they can have a lot of works burned up, but the foundation was right. You see the difference? In 1 Corinthians 3, they've got the foundation of Jesus. You know, when a house burns down, it's got a foundation. They might build a new house on top of that same foundation. I don't know if that's true necessarily, but, you know, they could because the foundation is still good. A tornado takes a house off. Hey, the foundation's there. Let's build, put, build right again on top of there. But if there's no foundation, that means that there was no salvation. Okay? Brother Frank. Because the unsaved has been in hell with just their soul. Their body has been in the ground. So their body has not faced judgment. And Matthew says, fear not him which is able to destroy the body and not the soul. Rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hellfire. So the, the, the purpose of the second resurrection is, is that person is going to give an account in their body. They've been separated from their body just like we have. When you die, you leave the body. Saved or lost, the body is left behind. Amen? So what happens to a lost person when they die? Their soul goes to hell. Their body is in the ground or in the sea or in an urn, wherever, just like ours is. When you, go, when you die, you go to heaven. Where's your body? It's down here. Well, we're waiting for a resurrection. And that body will be glorified, made, made, and that's God's triumph over sin. That we didn't just leave the body. No, he makes us a new glorified body. But the lost person also has to give an account in his body. And that's, I think, that's the, the purpose of this, this judgment. So what type of death? Is it physical? Both. The the dead, it's the sin. Go back to Revelation 20. I'll show it to you. Go back to Revelation 20, and I'll show you. <clears throat> verse 12 calls them the dead. That's the spiritually dead. But look at verse number 13. And the sea gave up the dead. Are those souls coming out of the sea? That's bodies. Look at verse 13. And death and hell deliver up the dead which were in them. Death, that's the body. Hell, that's the soul. So all of these souls and bodies are being reunited to stand in front of God, just like we. When does this judgment seat of Christ take place? Not as soon as you die. It's, I believe, after the resurrection. I think it's during the seven-year tribulation. You're not, you don't give an account uh, immediately when you die for your works, but when we're resurrected, we're in our body, then we're going to stand in front of the Lord Jesus in this body that he bought, that he has the right to, and we're gonna, our works are going to be judged. So that, that, these judgments happen with our soul and our body. You have a body, and, and that's what we have to give an account for, what we've done in the body. I think that the works is just the proof that they're condemned. 
Now, there, there will be some, there, I do believe that you're correct, there's some different damnation it talks about in the New Testament. But I, I think that what we're seeing here is, this is why you're declared guilty. You, the, the books are open, and, and now you're, th- you're found guilty. How guilty? By the, whatever the works were. Rick? Let's look at that verse because it'll show you a, a little bit where these, the, these two groups are coming from. Go to Philippians chapter number two. You're ahead of me, but you're right on schedule. And I never, I never understand how time can fly so quickly in a Wednesday sermon. Uh, I've got so much more to tell you, but let's see how much we get done with. Philippians chapter two. So it says that hell gives up the dead which were in them, right? Uh, in, in Revelation 20, death and hell delivers up the dead which were in them. Look at Philippians 2, and this is not the only place you find this phrase. <coughs> it's found in, um, in Revelation 5. It's found in uh, 1 Samuel 28. It's also referred to in Job 28. Philippians 2, verse number 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Jesus given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things where? And things... Who's under the earth? That's where the lost man is until he's delivered up to stand in front of judgment. Under the earth. What's under the earth? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you a verse in Job. Job 28, verse 5. You can write it down and you can catch it real quick, but let me read you what it says. As for the earth, out of it cometh bread, and under it is turned up as it were fire. Hmm. Ever seen a volcano erupt? Where does that fire come from? Down under the earth. Yeah, they talk about, I don't know, uh, all the science stuff, but there's some heat down underneath there. Now, I know if you've got geothermal, geothermal, it's 50 degrees right underneath the ground. That's cool. We like that, the air condition for free. Go a little deeper, son. And Job says there's fire underneath there. Um, let me give you another verse. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 14. And I'm not... I, you're right, I'm not given time to go into the context. I'm just trying to, to look at the subject of this. And we could obviously spend a lot more time looking at all these different contexts, but just hang with me here. Isaiah 5, <coughs> verse 14 says this. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude, their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. And God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Hell hath enlarged herself. Just just a quick little uh, uh, summary of of what I believe, and I'm not going to go through every verse to prove it. We know in the story of Luke 16 that there was a place of comfort and a place of torment called hell. The rich man went to hell and he was in, in torment. Lazarus went to Abram's bosom and there was a great gulf fixed and they could see each other. When Jesus resurrected from Ephesians 4, it seems that he uh, evacuated that paradise, because absent from the body nowadays, is to be present with, not present with Abraham, although I think he's in heaven, we're present with the Lord. Where's the Lord at? At the right hand of God the Father. So now a person's soul doesn't go to the same place that that the wicked was, even though it's comfort and torment separated by a great gulf. Now you, you, you die and you're saved, you go to be with the Lord. So what happened to hell? Hell enlarged herself. And my opinion is, Isaiah 5 means, now the fiery pit of hell is enlarged. It's the whole compartment. And in the New Testament, whenever you see the word hell, 
uh, you're referring to a place of, of the lost man, a sinner's judgment. Not a good place and a bad place. Okay? That, that's, that was just that Old Testament until Jesus resurrected. So hell's enlarged herself. And then in Revelation 20, hell delivers up the dead which were in it. Those are the knees under the earth that are going to bow down, Rick. That, well, a knee is a physical thing, right? And you all got bad knees? You know what I'm talking about. Your knees are bad. That, that's a physical. It's not your spiritual knee. You're talking about a physical knee going to bow down. We explain that bowing down is part of worship, isn't it? In the Bible, worship's not playing a guitar. No offense, Brother Ethan. We love the guitar players and Rick, but, but we, we understand worship has to do with bowing down. Every knee. Well, they didn't bow their knee when they were in it before they died as a lost man. Because if they'd have bowed their knee to Jesus as a lost man, they wouldn't be in hell. So they're going to bow the knee. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. And that's part of that too, Frank, is that that judgment, they're going to bow down. They will humbly, your Lord, we missed it. No, no, I, I, it's a good question. It leads into all those thoughts and, and putting them together. So the, the, the white throne judgment, knees are going to bow, but the uh, sentencing is going to be given. And where do they come from? Their bodies come out of the grave and the sea, and their souls come out of hell to reunite, and that's where they're going to get the judgment for the soul and the body. Soul and body for the lost man in, in Revelation 20. Sandy? Yeah, the works, it's not, not, not just, un, it's not unforgiven, but it's the works that we've done in our body. Okay, sin <coughs> is still taken care of on the cross. Now, unconfessed sin has to do with your fellowship in the body and how close you are to God right now. If you have unconfessed sin... It puts distance between you and your, your father. There's a fellowship issue. At this judgment, all, if our sin's brought up, what are we going to say? It's all covered by the blood. Our advocate, Jesus, is taking care of that. That's why our works are being judged, not us. Okay? Good question. Because uh, <clears throat> unconfessed sin, it's not that it's not forgiven. It's that it's affecting you in the flesh. Because how many payments are there for sin? Just one. Well, my, I got unforgiven sin. What are you going to offer to pay for it? You got a new offering? Your point back, this is the only offering that pays for sin. Now, you can say, I, I need to get forgiven. I want to repent. And that, that's totally appropriate. Because I'm married and I need to repent to my wife all the time. We get an argument and I got to get, I got to get it right. Now, I have never called the preacher and say, can you remarry us? We had an argument. I'd be, he'd be on speed dial, man, I'm telling you. Uh, in fact, he's in heaven, and I had to, I had to, have to bring him back to re remarry us every time we got uh, 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 something that we need to figure it out. We got the relationship, we're married, but now if I want to be close and have my biscuits unburned, amen, uh, I'm going to get right with that girl so that our prayers wouldn't be hindered and that our, our um, fellowship would be close. And there's been times when Hey, we're, we're like peas and carrots, man. We're just, and then there's times when we're just not peas and carrots. You know what I'm saying? That, that's a relationship. The fellowship is, is, is uh, what contingent about how we deal with things in the flesh. But the relationship is set. This judgment for the Christian, it's his works. He's saved, yet so as by fire. He's not being judged. Revelation 20, that guy's being judged by his works. See how that all fits together? A lot, of, a lot of that stuff together. Okay, any questions? Go back and let me just finish one more thought and we'll get out of here, okay? Revelation 20. I've got to share this because I'll skip it and, and uh, man, this is so good. Look at um, Revelation 20, verse number 10.
And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night. What's it say? Forever and ever. Now that's the same phrase used to describe how long God's glory is going to last, how long his throne is going to last, everything about God's going to be forever and ever, right? This is not annihilation. This second death is not you're burned up to a crisp and then you're done and you're forgotten. No, it's forever and ever. Now watch. Look at verse 10 again. The devil, in verse 10, is being cast where the false prophet and the beast are. You see that in verse number 10? The devil is being put where the beast and the false prophet are. Go back to chapter 19 and look at verse number 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet wrought miracles before him, which deceived them, and had received the mark of the beast, them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a... They're still there a thousand years later. They didn't burn up. They're there in 1910, and they're still there in 2010. Do you see that? There's a thousand years in between those two. It's not annihilation. It is eternal judgment. And now the devil is put in where they are, and they'll all be there forever and ever. It's not, someone says, well, you just kind of cease to exist. Baloney. That's not true. It's not Bible. I, it's not like I'm happy about this doctrine. I don't, I, I don't get a, a, a kick that someone's going to, experience judgment forever and ever. But friend, if you don't get saved, that's what's facing someone. Is the, the beast and the false prophet are not burned up for a thousand years. They're still there when the devil's cast in there. And then look at chapter 20, verse number 14. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was. And they're going to be there with the beast and the false prophet and the devil. And it's not annihilation. It's continuation. Ah, that's the seriousness of this. And you can say hellfire brimstone preacher. Just just the facts of it, man, should should surely motivate me to try my best to witness and to point someone to Jesus. I don't want my worst enemy to face this uh, consequence. So I just want to show you that it's not, well, they'll just it'll be done and gone and then that's it. No, that's not the way it is. Not the way it is. And the beast and the false prophet, thousand years, they're still there. A thousand years later, they're still there. And unfortunately, for the, anyone who rejects Jesus, it's always going to be there, okay? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for the word.